Hi, everyone out there. Thank you for joining us today. This is the first episode of Living Well, a podcast that helps you with healthy living in general, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual. And today we're going to get right to it. I have a great guest. I love this guy. He wrote a book called The Seven Secrets of a Stress-Free Life. And his name is Randall Johnson. Please welcome him to Living Well. Hi. Hello, Grace. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. You've been a guest on my other podcast. So now I'm happy to have you here again on this new podcast because you're perfect for it. So um, I always start at the beginning, uh, to, you know, like how did it all start? Like your journey, because I love how your book, uh, you do parallels with your life. Like, you know, I learned this because I went through this. Uh, so Tell us a little bit about your story, where you come from, what and, and what propelled you to write this book. Sure. So in the introduction of the book, I try to keep it very simple. Uh, I jump right to about middle life, maybe 40 years old. I had a master's degree in finance. I'd done to work on Wall Street. And, and at one point, I was managing a derivatives uh, hedge fund. And the stress was overwhelming. Ultimately, I started getting prescriptions from doctors. These are very addictive. Ultimately, it just drugs became an overwhelming compulsion that without them, I just didn't think I could function. And that led to obviously problems with work. And uh, eventually I was terminated and I went into a really dark space for a long time, almost a year where I, I just wasn't functioning. And fortunately, at that time, I had three daughters that I, I loved to death. and. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for them, probably would not have made it. Uh, no. But I wanted to try to do something. And, and so I dove into 12-step programs and therapy and self-help books and you know every possible way I could think of to try to, to get myself back on track, get out of depression, uh, you know, try to find a way to be, as they say in the 12-step program, happy, joyous, and free. And it took a lot of years. It took about seven years. Uh, in and out, uh, relapses and so on. But ultimately, I, I started to discover here and there particular principles that really seemed to help me. And eventually, those principles coalesced into seven. And starting around 2011, I began to put those principles together and to work with people. And then uh, finally, decided to write the book. And uh, that took three and a half years and only because one of my daughters decided to help me because she read a draft that was so horrible. She said, nobody would ever read it. <laughs> oh no, that's rough. <laughs> well, we have a good relationship. She's very, very brilliant. And uh, I hired her to actually sit with me and we went through every paragraph, every sentence, every yeah. word. It took about a year and a half and we got it down to a nice little short book that, you know, it's like what, 90 pages or something. And it just gives the essence of the, of the paradigm. Yeah, well, you had the content and you needed that structure. Sometimes it's hard for authors, you know, we have like that content and you just don't know where to start or like it's not organized, right? So you had to put all that uh, together. Um, I personally believe that stress is caused mainly like by our thoughts um, and how we react to stressful events or circumstances. Um, do you think that we can change those thoughts that produce stress in our lives? And if so, how do we? Do, how can we do that? <laughs> I think you're um, quoting from my introduction of the book. The million dollar question. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think, uh, if I can remember right, in, there's a sentence in the introduction that says, uh, uh, our stress is created in the mind, therefore the solution to stress must also be found in the mind. And yes. Oops. We lost you, RJ, for some reason. Oops. I'm sorry, guys. We lost him for some for a, a second. Um, hi, L. L. By the way, cannot uh, be here today because we're having technical issues, and we will resolve them for the next podcast. So that's why my beautiful uh, co-host L wasn't able to join us, but she is in the chat, and she will ask questions as soon as we get RJ back. He just froze. Hi, Dave. How are you? Good to see you. I know we were just talking about the mind. Yes, Al, we were talking about the mind. Um, 
so let me let me see if I can get RJ back. Um, maybe he needs to. Okay, he left, which is good, so he can like log himself back in. Um, hi, the old time soap company. So now that we're waiting for RJ, let me tell you guys. After my cancer journey, my breast cancer journey, I started doing everything clean, like eating clean. Everything I use is clean products, organic products, um, no chemicals, no carcinogenics. And the Old Town Soap Company, oh my gosh, the best soap. They even have like natural shampoo and conditioner. They're amazing. I use all their products. You guys need to definitely follow them on Instagram and Facebook. It's the Old Town Soap Company. So thank you for joining us uh, here. Here she is, Ernestine. So thank you so much. And my beautiful, uh, <laughs> my beautiful co-host, where is she? I miss you, L. I figured out what the sound issue was. I totally figured it out. Uh, so the old town of Ernestine. So, so proud of your progress, Grace. Thank you. Yes, it's it's been quite a journey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, Al, love that. Caring for your body plays a role for sure. And we have RJ here. He is back. All right. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> uh, the modem crashed. Can you believe it? Oh, it hasn't crashed in months. And of course, it waits right to this moment. So I'm on my uh, mobile phone hotspot just to keep going. Oh, good, good, good. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to be, it's going to be fun. We were, okay, let's yes. resume. Okay. Um, we oh wait there's an echo again there's an echo hold on let me fix that okay i i do have echo cancellation on it so it's not on my end it's like is mercury on retrograde I, or something i don't have an echo oh man okay so i don't hear an echo okay i did hear it maybe i'm hallucinating i don't know am i on acid or something i'm not sure uh <laughs> i don't know what's going on but seriously so we were talking about like the thoughts. Like, how, can Grace, you, how can you change? You hear an echo, LC? I don't know what it is. It's so weird. It's it's crazy. Okay. Um, so you're in your laptop, right, RJ? Yes. Okay. Okay. So so tell us, you were saying like I might have to go to my phone. Yeah, I we can't we can't hear you for some reason, but we were talking about uh, how our thoughts, you know, create stress. So yeah. our thoughts can actually deprogram, debunk the stress, right? They can, they can help us deal with the stress. So if we can hear you, <laughs> how can we do that? Well, how, can you hear me now? Yes, yes keep going, no? keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, are, are you stressed right now, Grace? No, I'm not stressed at all. Let me tell you, after beating cancer, it's like I'm happy to be alive. So this is like, eh, big whoop. Okay, so yes, if, if stress is created in the mind, but yet people always say, oh, if only I had a better job, if only I had a better different relationship, if only I had more want to make some external circumstances there's you with me still uh yeah but it's like super choppy i don't know what's going on i i think it might be your internet it could yeah, why be don't I just switch to my phone yeah switch to your phone do whatever you need to do i'll i'll entertain the guests <laughs> You do what you have to do. Uh, so here is Daryl. Hi, Lady Grace. I had a job in food service for 31 years. The last three years of my employment, I suffered from stress, related anxiety to the point where I passed out on the job. Oh, my God. Now, what do you think would have been the source of all this? Well, sometimes I personally I think that, yes, circumstances can definitely stress us and create anxiety or depression for sure. Um in my breast cancer journey, my breast cancer healing journey, what I, I had a choice at some point, I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna like be miserable throughout my treatment and, and, you know, just be depressed, or I'm just gonna laugh through it. So I decided to laugh through it. And just, you know, of course, I had like, you know, like we all do when we feel like we need to cry about something or 
or just like we're angry about something, just let that feeling play out. That's what I would do. Just let that feeling play out and then go back to thinking, okay, everything is going to be okay. This is not going to last forever. I'm going to be okay. And it's kind of like reprogramming your mind, which is something that um, sounds like it's not easy to do, but it is easy to do. And RJ is back and he's going to tell us about reprogramming our minds. So RJ, you're here. Okay, I can hear like you playing. Well. Okay, yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. How uh, it's okay. It's a little choppy still. <laughs> I'm not sure what I, I guess I could go outside. Maybe it's, it's very cloudy today and I think that's messing my. Probably, but that's okay now. Now we're good. So we were talking about changing your thoughts, your thinking pattern. Um, Daryl had just posted that, yeah. you know, he suffered from anxiety and I'm sure you, you heard what I said, uh, cause you were still here, but, um, so how, what would you tell to Daryl? Like, how can you deal with something external that creates so much anxiety that you just like pass out and you're just like, don't know what to do. Well, and at the end of my, I mean, we're really basic. I should just read the introduction. It takes, you know, less than five minutes, but to summarize some stress really is sourced in a pathology. It, it may need uh, work with a therapist, a psychiatrist medication. Yeah. So if anxiety is really overwhelming and you have like anxiety disorder uh, and you're, you know, that's the diagnostic manual that the, doctors use to diagnose people i i think you know i i'm bipolar so you know i get to deal with a lot of those ups and downs and unfortunately it was that neurochemical imbalance that really drove a lot of my problems but then forced me to have to find ways to deal with it so i use a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy to manage some of those kind of neurochemical issues so if uh your listener is, is has real anxiety disorder really should seek professional help. If it's just kind of, I'm just feel anxious a lot, then uh, the point is to, is to continually raise your self-awareness. The key is we're so locked into our feelings that we don't even know what we're feeling. A person's raging in anger. They don't, they're not observing themselves going, boy, I'm really irritated right now. And the key to living a stress-free life is to, in essence, create this observer person who sits kind of right here and it's just looking at you all the time and it's communicating with your consciousness saying, hey, do you realize you're acting like an idiot or, you know, whatever? And it's giving you feedback on, boy, that, that, that's awesome. Go with that. Or, hey, maybe you should rethink this. So you want to start to have a dialogue with like an externalized consciousness that can be have a better perspective on how your life goes. So in the book, I have a, a, a chapter called The Effortless stress elimination formula and it's a formula for a process that you can go through to create a more externalized observer consciousness and begin to interact with it and develop it and when you do that you you kind of see that life is i don't know i, I treat life like a video game it, yes, it, it, you're, it is, right? you just you're, you're here and i mean there is a, a theory in quantum physics that that we live in a simulation, right? Yeah. Nick Bostrom created this in 2003. And as you know, I, I'm working, you know, on, on my graduate degree in philosophy of religion. So I'm doing a lot in neuroscience and quantum physics and things. So if we are living in a simulation, why are we taking it so darn serious? Exactly. It, it's, I know, I know. I was, I was telling Daryl that, you know, um, I do suffer from anxiety. I've never been on, well, I've been on medication when I was younger. Uh, but, you know, when I got diagnosed with cancer, I really had to find a way to deal with it where I wouldn't be so anxious and so, you know, worried about it that um, I, you know, I what I did is I, I'm like, I can be miserable through it or I can laugh my way through it or have fun through it. And I had fun, believe it or not. I was always with my caretaker, my best friend. You know, we were always laughing at the hospital. <laughs> you know, we were like crazy. <laughs> and and just everything it was so ridiculous you know i was facing the possibility of death and um i mean it's like oh, if i make it i'm gonna be so happy after this you know because i could have died like now i'm looking at everything and i'm like 
I could just be in another dimension now. I could be dead. And instead I get to live this, you know, as an avatar in the simulation for a little longer and have a little fun and experience life. So um, is that what you're talking about also when you're saying like, like kind of like your higher self talking to you and, and kind of like bitch slapping you? <laughs> yeah, it really is just being able to. Th so there's a concept in psychology called the Johari window. And it, it's a window that's a, it's like a square and it's divided into four quadrants. And the idea is there are things that, that we can see about ourselves, and there are things that others can see about ourselves. And so if you make those four combinations, some things I see you don't see, some things you see I don't see. I mean, when I was dropping into addiction, they always say the alcoholic is the last guy to, to know that he's an alcoholic. Everybody else has been seeing him go down the drain for years. And so, so we're in denial about you know, seeing us the way that others can see things, obviously. And, and there's some things that we both see, and then there's some things that are so hidden, I don't know it, nobody else knows it, those are my deepest secrets. And so what we want to do with this observer function is to bring more of that that depth of, of, un, of hidden consciousness, bring it up to consciousness, and the more we share with others, you know, uh, uh, Brene Brown, right, she became famous for her her TED talk on vulnerability. And I, at one point, you know, was hiding all of these things about myself and it's so stressful. And when I finally just said, you know, what, I'm just going to, you know, you go to an AA meeting, you get up and tell your story and you just think everybody's going to, you know, disdain you, but then they're cheering and clapping and, you know, giving you hugs because, Hey, you're finally admitting what's going on. So, uh, right. it's really important to have that full consciousness to really see ourselves clearly as to exactly who we are. Absolutely. I agree. Um, so here, my co-host who wasn't able to make it due to probably my issue of not doing the echo cancellation. We were testing the other day and it was like, I hear an echo. Where is it coming from? And now that I figured it out, she's like, I look like a grandma, so I can't join you. It's like, All right, girl, whatever. we're both vain, both of us. Um, okay. So RJ, he, she's asking, I love the self-talking coaching approach. Do you feel this pertains to meditation, being silent and going within? May you elaborate on your thoughts? Well, you know, starting around 1990, I... Was uh, and I'd lived in Japan for a while, and I was exposed to some Buddhism and Zen and things. And when I came back, I started doing some meditation, and I meditated for like I don't know twenty years. So while I'm a complete fan of meditation, mm -hmm. I also have a caveat about it. In my book, I say, look, uh, you think about a pressure cooker pot on a on a burner, and it's got the water in it. And the, burners cranked up and the pressure builds and then the, there's a whistle and the valve kind of releases the steam and meditation is great like i'm stressed out let me just pause get present meditate and then 10 minutes later okay i'm done i'm feeling better and then 10 minutes after that, i'm all stressed again because it just the, the pressure's built up and the idea in, in the book is that the solution is to turn off the burner not release the steam and so for me turning off the burner is a matter of, of recreating a new belief system, uh, a paradigm shift in consciousness. And so the seven secrets of, of a stress-free life, in my book, those seven secrets are just principles that people can uh, look at and say, hey, maybe if I live by this set of principles, which I believe are in my graduate studies in philosophy and religion, uh, I found that they're in conflict with, with uh, uh, Believe. I mean, atheists can adopt them, you know, every people of, of any faith and uh, uh, just their fundamental principles. So two or three of them and talk about them and just to give a flavor for how they work in that uh, if you change the way you approach in your external environment, right? We have five senses that we're seeing, we're hearing, we're touching things and our brain has pattern of how it processes those those inputs and pattern matching to things in our life. We talk about childhood traumas and and mm -hmm. and all these things. Well, that creates these programs inside of our head that says to survive, I've got to do these certain things or react or blow away. And generally in early life, it, the survival, they work. But as an adult, most of those programs are kind of productive. 
So we want to find a way to blow those programs up and replace them with some new pathways, with some new ways of reacting to stimuli. It allows us to process it uh, so that we don't uh, in guilt, shame, and regret about the past or worry, anxiety, or future. And in the present moment, we don't have to meditate or in order to get rid of stress. It just doesn't exist because we're not thinking creates it in the first place. Yes, and it's it's so true. It's um, it's kind of like a deprogramming because I felt that that's what I did during my cancer journey. It's like deprogramming myself of you know thinking about like the future, like what if I you know this happens and what if the treatment doesn't work and what you know like these were life threatening things that were going through. My, and I was like, you know what? Shut up, Grace. <laughs> like stop it. Stop. Don't think about that. Just live in the now. Now you you know you're doing the treatment. You have everything you need. You're very, very lucky. And just enjoy now. We worry so much about the past. You know, we let it influence our now. And then the the future is the imagination because it hasn't happened. And it's like in our heads, we're creating these scenarios that are like insane. And so it's like just, I feel like whenever I, you know, I go into the future or the past, I just like look at things here. Like, okay, there's a, you know, uh, a painting there. There's a TV. Like I ground myself in where I am at the moment. And that brings me back to today now, because that's all we got is now the rest is BS. It doesn't exist. Well, and that's true. Well, it, it, it is true. I'm not even sure now exists either. However, uh, again, in one of my principles where I talk about this idea that, you know, mindfulness is so popular these days, it's really the way to live. The problem with that is it's really difficult to live that way. Again, I meditated for 20 years, you know, I became a, a Zen monk and I, I've taken the Bodhisattva vow and, you know, okay, great. I have that, that result of all that effort. But for someone that's just trying to survive, right? They're, they've got kids, they've got work, they've got bills to pay, they, you know, everything going on in their life and it's crazy. But where do they find 20 minutes or an, an hour to meditate every day? So we want to come up with a different approach that we can do that doesn't require really any time, li very little time. And it definitely doesn't require any effort other than become more self-aware. Yes, it's almost like changing gears. Like whenever these thoughts start, you know, that's how I feel it is. It's like the thoughts keep coming to me and I'm like, well, time to change gears because these thoughts are just going to give me anxiety, depression. They're going to drive me nuts. So they're useless. They're pointless. So let's just like, I shoot them away. I'm like, go away. <laughs> you don't belong here. Bye, bitch. Bye, bye. So yeah. you know, the only question though, Grace, is after you get rid of them, you've got this empty space and, you know, space abhors a vacuum. So new thoughts are going to immediately try to fill it. And the question is, do you randomly just see whatever new thought comes in there? Or the idea is there's certain, you know, programs or certain beliefs that you can say, I'm going to replace that thought with this new thought. And that is where I'm coming from in, in the research that I'm doing in school and my graduate studies and, and how I approach it in the book is as soon as you are self-aware, oh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm and, and I, I focus on stress because that's the thing that we can, you know, have most easily self-recognize, oh, I'm feeling stressed right now, but it could easily be I'm feeling anger, I'm feeling guilt, shame, regret, worry, anxiety, fear, whatever negative emotion I'm feeling, let me pause and say, why am I feeling that? And most people will say, I have no idea, or that person's making, you know, irritating me. The driver cut me off on the road. And the question, no. And so what I represent in the book is the source of stress is a conflict between what you are believing and a, one of the seven or all of the seven principles. When you are in conflict with one or more of those principles, it's going to lead to stress. It's, a, it's an incredible claim. And, then, you know, I'm spending years in school trying to devise ways of, of uh, producing evidence for it in, in a rigorous academic setting. So let's just take one of those uh, principles, because I think it's the one that causes the more, most stress in our society today. And that was secret number four, which is at the center of the book, because it's the center to me of almost the whole problem that we have. And that is give up being right. Yes, that's ego-based completely. It's like, a, like I mean, 
I agree. How many people are, are angry and irritated on social media because some idiot, as they suppose, is saying some conspiracy theory and then they ha and you've got the progressives and the, the right wing people and they're all arguing it. and everybody thinks if only they believe the way I believe, we'd all, you know, do better. And nobody wants to say, well, maybe I'm I'm wrong or maybe there's room for compromise. It's just become so polarized that yeah. it's really destroying the fabric of society. So right. giving up being right is probably the most powerful way of getting rid of stress. And the only question that people say, well, what do you mean? Like my spouse is gaslighting me. I'm supposed to just let them gaslight me and, and let them be right all the time. No, there's still room for boundaries and, you know, negotiate and compromise and, and you don't have to put up with anything in your life. You have the, some of the other secrets allow you to take responsibility for your life and, and make decisions on how you want to live. And so the point is just in getting out of being right, you're not capitulating. You're just opening up a space to consider the other person's point of view. Maybe they do have something to offer. And maybe if they if you do that, they'll do it in return. And now you can have a dialogue. I, I saw a podcast the other day where two adamantly, uh, I mean, they just should hate each other. They're they're dialectics were so opposite and they got on there and they had this very rational i think it was like bill maher and and ben shapiro or something like that oh right God, and, like polar <laughs> and they had this really good dialogue you know in which they were able to just rationally consider the other person's point of view they may not agree on most everything but they could at least have a dialogue and they didn't have to be so stuck in their rightness that they just tried to ram it down the other guy's throat Absolutely. And it's our egos, you know, like we want to be right because it feels good, <laughs> you know, it and it's it, it's pointless. Who cares about being right? Really? I'd rather have peace and joy than be right. That's so much more important, I think. And once like whenever I want to be right, I'm like, do I really want to fight <laughs> with these people, you know, and be right? It's like I'm going to waste my time. It's just going to create negative feelings. I'm just going to go about my business and just have peace and joy and they can think whatever they think and it's okay. And I think whatever I think, but, but yes, you're right. I think that, um, do you think like the division that's happening now, which is really kind of crazy, is it at some point, do you think the pendulum is going to swing to where people are going to be a little bit more open to hearing other people's opinions, even if they're completely different from them? <laughs> yes or no? You know, <laughs> You're like, like this. I send my prayers out to the universe every day, right? I mean, if it is a video game, it's like, you know, the goal is to keep the game going as long as possible and not self-destruct. Right. Uh, so I'm hoping that, 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 the, that the programmers of the universe, whether it's God or, or some, you know, higher power, oh, uh, yeah. that they'll insert a few new programs to try to calm things down a little bit. I mean, this Ukraine war could turn nuclear. I mean, there's, there's a lot of a lot of things going crazy right now and and nobody seems to want to back up back down and you know try to have dialogues so i don't know i'm i'm a i'm a little concerned but i'm always hopeful somehow i i i try to to extrapolate my own personal experience i had to really self-destruct just to the edge of death before i was willing to say okay maybe there's a problem here because all the way down the drain, I kept fighting for what I thought, you know, was what I wanted or, or was I was blaming everybody else and, and all of these, these things that led to, to this implosion. And maybe sometimes it's critical to hit a dark night of the soul in order to be able to come back from that and, and self-reflect and find a, a new path to a, to a higher state of being. You have, to, you have to go down before you can go higher. And maybe our world has to do some more things. I mean, that recent earthquake is shaking up some people there. California is going to drop off into the ocean any day now, maybe. I, I'm not sure. I've got my surfboard. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Life in Los Angeles has been very interesting lately. So uh, we'll see. But, yeah, I, I always have hope. Uh, and... Uh, I, I all I can do is keep keep kind of preaching my my message and uh, hope that it'll find traction somewhere. I love it. No, you're like a light worker. They call they call <laughs> you. Uh, yeah, you're like a light worker. You know, shining light. And I love how you use your you know your the drama in your life that that you know and the enlightenment that ensued to help other people. And that's why, guys, you need to get this book. Is amazing i read it a couple of times actually not just once um and being around you too because we're friends you know it's like 
has enlightened me. I know I never told you that, but before my cancer journey, you kind of enlightened me to a lot of things that actually helped me through my cancer journey, because I did remember stuff that you told me. And, and so you had an influence on my life, a very positive influence. So thank you for that, for shining your light. And I absorbed all that light. I was like, <laughs> give me some of that light. <laughs> well, you have a way of sharing your light through comedy that is, uh, that's really fun. And it de definitely brightens up my day and, and many others as well. So it, it works both ways. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so here's Elle, my co-host, who next time you guys are going to see her beautiful face because <laughs> I figured out the problem. Uh, so she's asking, she's saying, your message is powerful, RJ. Out of the seven stress relievers, is there one that is paramount above the others? Yes. So secret seven is the secret that circumscribes all of the other secrets. It it holds them together. And that secret says, love yourself first, then others. So again, it's a little bit uh, contradictory. We always talk about love your neighbor and altruism. Uh, interestingly, I mean, just a quick aside. So in my philosophy class last semester, uh, so I'm a, I'm a student at Claremont Graduate University here in LA area. And uh, we were studying uh, evil was the topic for the entire semester. And we studied all the theologians and the philosophers from you know, Plato all the way to more current and what was their take on evil. And I really, I really connected with Nietzsche, who's very controversial guy and kind of, kind of the bad boy of philosophy. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he argues that altruism is the worst evil ever. And I kind of, <laughs> so I, I wrote my paper for my research paper. The class was called a defense of moral egoism. And oh, that's point, hilarious. Yeah. And the point is, is altruism, can it, can it can, is it possible to have pure altruism or do we always have an agenda? Do we always have a, some sort of self-serving motive or something for it? You know, is it really possible to give and serve in some way without zero expectation of anything coming back? Maybe Mother Teresa or something, I don't know. But for most of us normal mortal humans, probably not. And so what it came to is when, and that, that's a scripture from the New Testament where Jesus said, love thy neighbor as thyself. And everybody always remembers love thy neighbor, but they don't remember love thyself. Well, in 1995, when I went to my first uh, AA meeting, uh, they, they read all these little things from the AA book. And one of the things that said was, you can't give away something you don't have. So get your own life in order. And then the step 12 is to share your message for others to help them become you know, clean and sober. And I realized, yeah, if you don't love yourself, how can you possibly love other people, especially altruistically or, or without a motive? And and the real problem is a lot of people are so focused on serving and giving to others that they neglect themselves. And then in the end, they become resentful or, or they did it thinking that the other person would love them back, especially in a relationship. I give, 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 give. And then they just take advantage and then they're all upset and unhappy. Why aren't they loving me back? And so the real thing, and it seems selfish, it seems self-centered, but it's not yeah. really that we have to develop self-love. So I have in the book, I have a little, uh, uh, process that I do to help us kind of measure where we stand on the self-love scale and how we can increase our self-love. Maybe I could just share that for, for one minute. Please do. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So you take your phone or a, a mirror if you have it. And uh, if the screen, you know, your phone is off and you look in it, you can usually see your face reflected in, in your phone. So you want to look in the mirror in the bathroom or wherever or look in your phone and you want to look and you see yourself in there and you're, you're looking back at you. And when you look at that person, you want to say, I love you. Yes, I love that. And and. So in some of the coaching and things that I've done, that's like the very first thing in the very first meeting is I want to get a sense where that person is in terms of their self-love. It's amazing that people go, uh, uh, <laughs> nah, I just don't love myself. I hate myself or, or whatever they're saying. And, and it's, it's really sad. And so we really want to work on what can we do to develop self-love? Because once we can accept ourselves, and remember, self-love isn't a matter of becoming perfect and eliminating all sin or any of the, these religious things. It's a matter of accepting ourselves on exactly who we are, the way we are right now, 
you know, sure, we're going to change and improve and there's things we can develop to become a better person. Just go with, I mean, you know me enough, Grace. I don't know. It just sounds so, so arrogant, but I love myself more than anything else on the entire universe, right? I'm my favorite guy. And you should love yourself because (laughs) also, you know, when you were talking about like when people forget about themselves and they give love and then they expect the other person to be grateful or whatever, that's transactional. But when you love yourself, you really got give out love just because and it doesn't matter you don't expect anything because you got you you know it's like romantic love it's like people expect romantic love to give them what they need or fill that void you fill that void because you love yourself so your own love is going to just fill you and you're not going to need anyone to do that for you to fill that hole um and i think that's probably what you were saying right am i <laughs> translating yeah. uh, like imagine we have a little a little cup or something inside of us and it needs to be filled right we need nurturing and we need um you know compassion and comfort and that because again remember for most of us i think we were started life inside of a womb and it was warm and comfortable and there was this nice rhythmic heart beating kind of like the white noise machine that keep us you know all calm and 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 then uh you know if we needed food we didn't have to go to the grocery store the umbilical cord just took care of everything waste products were removed it was this really wonderful garden of eden state which i believe that story in in genesis and the bible of the garden eden is really a, a metaphor for how we're born and then we're thrust into the lone and dreary world through birth or or however it it happens and and then it's miserable it's cold and wet and we're crying and we don't get food and it's just a horrible experience we all have childhood trauma because we had a trauma from basically the moment of birth uh at least i don't know maybe there's a way around it but i don't really know so so we really start off needing and just it just you know being so needy and and wanting love and and grasping for it and and demanding it uh you just think of an infant baby so how do we get out of that well, there's a little cup inside of us that's never, ever going to just naturally, you know, always be full. It, it, we're going to anything that we do, that little cup is going to through entropy, it's, it's going to go down. And so we have to refill it. And there's ways of refilling it. But sometimes doing it way we think, well, if I help somebody else, that'll help me feel better about myself. That's true. Well, yeah. it could be true, but it's not guaranteed to always be true. I know when I help some people. Uh, it might feel good, but sometimes I help them because I don't know, maybe I wanted to avoid a circumstance. And so I just kind of had to fake it. But, but the point being that I always have to stop and say, how full is my cup? And if my cup is like half, half drained, I got to take some time to do something fun for me. And we have our five yes. love languages or other things that we can, can do to a hobby or whatever that really makes us feel good or if we're in a relationship do something in that way to to help get that cup filled. But when the cup is full and it starts overflowing, it's the overflow of the love energy that has to go somewhere. I can't, I'm so full. It's coming out of me. So it's going to, that's the altruism. That's the gift is it's just pouring out because it doesn't have any place else to go. I love that. And also, you know, another thing that I found um, that I used to be more transactional and now I'm coming from loving myself, right? Being totally cool, being by myself or whatever and not needing other people. And so it's um, it's almost like um, I'm just happy with myself. And whenever you're, you were talking about like people draining you, like sometimes when you give a lot, you feel, oh, you're around people you feel drained and you need to recharge. And that's when you need the me time. And it's not selfish. It's actually good because it will give you what you need. And then once you got it, and again, you overflow again, because you got what you need. It's all in you, right? That you need to take a break. Then you can go back to the world and, you know, overflow the love. And then it's kind of like, I feel like it's like a ping pong thing. (laughs) I get drained a lot. I don't know if I'm not handling my energy well or whatever, but I feel sometimes when I'm around a lot of people and I do because of what I do, I feel drained. And, uh, 
and I need to be by myself and just, like you said, fill my cup. And then that's when I, but we have to listen to that and honor that time that we need for ourselves and that me time and that self-care time. We got to honor it. Definitely. That's, yeah. That's a lot of us. I used to not honor it at all and kept saying yes to things when I was completely drained and had nothing to give. So is it selfish? It's not. Mm -hmm. Learn to say no. It's one of the great gifts of life, right? And boundaries. Uh, those were things I knew nothing about, but yeah. I learned them all through my, in my recovery and in lots of counseling and therapy and psychi psychiatric treatment and everything else that I did. You know, th there's a lot of good books and things out there to help us learn how to, to protect ourselves. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yes. So uh, with this, this has been amazing. I don't want to continue. You know why? Because we're going to give away all the seven secrets and I want people to buy the book. Yeah. You need to read this book. It's amazing. It is so easy to read and so fun. And it's just very enlightening. So. Well, let me just say one thing is because uh, I certainly, I mean, I think the book list price is like $15 and and I went to Amazon and say, what's there's a, a because I publish it through Amazon, they have to make a certain amount of money. I said, well, what's what what's the minimum amount you'll let me charge? I think it was like five or six dollars. And so I think that's the price. If you go on Amazon, I just try to get it out there. I'm, I'm not trying to make money off of it. But even even to the point of uh, if I, I think maybe I can just give you my email or something. If people email me, I'll just email them a PDF copy of the book and oh. they can just look at it that way. It, would, it wouldn't even cost them a, a dime. So, oh, um, so sweet. What is your email? You guys yeah. get ready. Yeah, it, it's pretty simple, right? It, so it's R Johnson for, for my name. And then the number 2000, like the Y2K thing. So R Johnson, 2000 at gmail.com. Perfect. Oh, you are yeah. so generous. Thank you. You're, yeah, you're just amazing. You're, I know you're doing this because you want to help people. And, it, you know, just the fact that you're willing to send free PDFs let, says a lot about you. So thank you so much. Thank you for being on the show. You're amazing. Here's the, you getting rave reviews. Um, here's L. the book is such a treasure. Wow, RJ, ama amazing. Thank you. What a treat. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, email rjohnson2000 at gmail, right? Yes. Right. And he'll send you a copy of the book. It's a must read. It's going to make your life so much better. All right, RJ, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to see you and great to talk to you. Really wonderful. Thank you for inviting me, Grace. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. You were great. Thank you for your comments and your questions. And I will see you guys in like three weeks. I think we have the next um, podcast. Uh, let me see the next. We changed it with L. I'm not sure where. Oh my God. When did we have it, L? I don't remember. I didn't even write it down. Okay. I think it's April 2nd that we have the next uh, podcast. So I'll, I'll put out flyers and stuff so you guys will know. Thank you so much. And I will see you guys in three weeks. Bye. Bye-bye.